my second draft. Right, I'm going to get us going. Because it's two minutes after 12, and it's progressing two minutes is good enough. Um, so we have coffee clash today, and it is pasta clash today. With, with, with Emma Bull. I had a lot of coffee before I came, so. <laughs> well, your glad you're on the news. Yeah. So. Yes. My secret identity is Coffee M. That's my, my secret cowgirl identity. <laughs> so today we have Emma Bull, who is kind of the godmother of urban fantasy. Um, some of you know her. She wrote War for the Oaks, which is set here in the Twin Cities. Everybody's going like, yeah. Really, one of the earliest and most important urban fantasy novels. She's written novels, screenplays, children books, short stories. It's a member of the Interstate Writers Workshop, aka the Scribblings. Um, has conducted writing workshops in Los Angeles, at Clarion, and at Puma Writers. She plays guitar. She sings. She was in Flash Girls. The cat's laughing. And uh, her and her this husband. This is disturbing. It is disturbing. Being introduced isn't? by somebody who knows my entire history. I, that's really scary. Wikipedia is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Her and her husband also uh, created and edited and shared Lie of that universe for a long, long time. Uh, novels include War for the Oaks, Falcon, the Bone Dance Territory, which I adore because I love the secret mystery in the Western. So. And she is also the producer of Shadow Unit, a web fiction project she shares with Elizabeth Bear, Sarah Monet, Will, and Amanda Downing. And so... And I'm just, Leah Bobbitt. And Leah Bobbitt, that's right. going to be a, a name to conjure with yes. very shortly. So I'm just going to get us started with the very first question. What's the current project? What are you working on right now? Oh, okay. Um, right now, there are, well, there are three things on my plate, but as I was just saying, we met Adam Stumpet downstairs. It's like, oh my God, this place is writer's central on Sunday. He just came through to get a couple of donuts on the way to work. We should have him in. We did. He was, he was, yeah, he was on his way to work, so okay. he wouldn't come in. But, but, but I was, Adam was saying, that he was working on three books and, and a graphic novel or two books and a graphic novel and I said, how do you do, how do you work intensely on multiple projects at once because my brain doesn't shift that fast. But now that Michael asks me the question, I realize, well, I'm working on three projects. <laughs> so I feel really silly. Um, I'm working on the sequel to Territory, which is called Claim. Um, which I <laughs> promise to you guys, all my readers, and especially my editor, we will get to the gunfight this time. <laughs> because there's a gunfight in this story, and people probably expect it to happen on the page, and it will. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> and, and the research for that continues to be wonderful, and I'm a little afraid of not finishing the book before the next wave of major historical discovery comes out about anything that happens <laughs> that, that's, that's about Tombstone in, in, in 1881. Because history doesn't, I, you know, history already happened, but we don't know it all. So they keep finding new documents and all kinds of things, and I am going to be so pissed off if by the time I get this manuscript done, <laughs> they have come up with a new scholarship that says, no, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, I'm working on... Well, my, it's probably a novella, because that's what happens when I write short stories. Uh, uh, that I'm kind of hoping might turn into a series, because I really like these people. And basically, my, my, my formative idea was, what would happen if Wonder Woman was not a comic book character, but an urban fantasy character? And I started from there, and I'm having a really great time. Um, and the third thing, which I'm really ridiculously excited about, because I'm, I'm a huge fan girl for this. Uh, those of you, you may have, you guys may have heard me babble on convention panels, if you have been to convention panels. You may have heard me talk about Zombies Run. Yes. Okay, you remember. If any of the rest of you know about Zombies Run? No. Oh, I've been a fan girl for Zombies Run for a while. Is okay. it the app that, that you need yes. to run with? Okay, yes, then I, then it I'm is. Um, what, what, a friend of mine in Tucson discovered this and was a big fan of it. And she said, look, it's great. You put it on your iPod, your phone, whatever, and it, it uses your, your, a selected playlist, your, your selected music, but interspersed with it, 
is all of your radio messages from the dispatcher because you are runner five for Able Township after the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and they send you out on missions and you, you have to go and get stuff and run from zombies. <laughs> this, as you might expect, kind of encourages you to keep running. <laughs> There's a guy in your headphones saying, there's a swarm coming up at three o'clock. Just you know, they're 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 right behind you. Run, runner five, run! <laughs> you do, trust me. <laughs> and, but it's not just an exercise app. It's got these great continuing stories. It has continuity and characters, and you get to know all of the people at Able Township and all of the politics and the, the you slowly find out the science behind the zombie apocalypse. It's a really great story. So I started using this thing mostly because I said, well, okay, yeah, I need to kind of get off the couch and I, I want to I start, you know, get a little more physical. I started playing Zombies Run. And I ran my first 5K race last October and a 7K last month. So it kind of works and it's really fun and I always want to know what happens next. The super cool thing that happened to me last year and is happening to me again is the woman who basically is the story editor has also read my stuff. And when she found out that I was a Zombies Run fan, she said, so do you want to write an episode? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm now I'm working on my second episode, which I warn you, involves roller derby. Why? Because zombies and roller derby always go together. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like a great map. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I see it. Do you ever do you ever see people around and about and observe their behavior and say that person is listening to zombies run? Can you tell? I try to look for it because there will be things that you know. There's the whole speed up thing that that ooh suddenly you know sudden sudden urge to run a little faster than you were before. Are we having zombie chase here? Um, mostly, what happens to me when I'm doing it is I will start grinning, and so I look around for runners wearing headphones who have all all of a sudden started going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening at the same time. Pardon? Everybody's experiencing the same. Thing no, the same no. It's you're 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 doing it all pretty much, you know, on, on, you at your own speed. Uh -huh. Yeah. But but there are a lot of things in the episodes that you just kind of go, oh, cool, one for ours. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I had heard about this in an app review of Great Fitness apps at the library, and it was so. I was very curious about it, so it's nice to actually meet somebody who's, who's doing zombies right now. I, I, I thought that, that one sounded hilarious. So. Also, you can even do it when walking, you can do it on a treadmill or on an elliptical machine. Uh, I know a lot of people who play it as a, a, a walking game. So you can set the zombie speed? Well, you can turn off zombie chases. If you're feeling like that's just a little too much pressure, you can say, no, no, I don't actually want to hear the increasingly loud groaning noises of the zombies. <laughs> Please don't do that to me, because, you know, I, I'm a little nervous. I'm, I'm not entirely comfortable with that. So I have zombie chases turned off. There's, if you want to go the other way, there's a there's some marathon where they actually have people dress as zombies and yes. chase you. Yes, they have, they have the zombie runs, which I, I think there was one last uh, year in Minneapolis. Yeah. I think that was the first um, one I heard. And there's a, a it's turned into a big deal. I mean, last year I think there was this whole cordoned off area in downtown <laughs> where they had basically a, a kind of. of role-playing rave in the middle of downtown and you know you were pretending that you were in the midst of the zombie apocalypse and and you know there was a race and there was the, a party uh, was that the zombie pub crawl zombie so. pub crawl was part of it i know wasn't. it was part of the same thing but it just looks that like was, it was that, was, that was a hysterical day because i saw all these people waiting for the bus when i was eating my they were all dressed up as zombies yes. going to go downtown and I was like, when Cassie was going, what's going on? I said, I think it's the zombie pup crawl. They're just waiting for their bus. And she said, they look really, really in characters. They're all going, yeah. <laughs> 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 and I want her wait for the bus. You know it's got to be the same kind of fun that you get in a LARP when you're, you know, you're, 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 you're dressed up, you're in makeup, you're in character, and you get to ride a bus. Right. You know? <laughs> How great is that got to be? 
Oh. We were on our way down to the zombie pub crawl, and someone pulled up in a car, and she rolled her window down and said, Why are you dressed like that? She was very disturbed. <laughs> and I was like, it's okay. And I did the totally wrong thing. I said, it's okay. We're going zombie pub crawl. And later I thought I should have went, Brains! <laughs> I missed the moment. <laughs> but you could just see, she was scared. She was actually freaked out. It's all right, ma'am. We're just dead. <laughs> all right, hands in the air. I want, want to see questions. This is a coffee question. It's your chance to ask them a question. Let's come on. Hands up. Somebody put a hand up. Don't. Yeah, right. right there. <laughs> so how was, was War for the Oaks your first book? That was. How long had you been writing when you wrote that? Because it's, it's tremendous. I, well, it's, it, it depends on how you define writing. I mean, writing pretty much all through school, because one of the things that I learned really early on, I think I learned this in grade school, was if we were assigned to write like a two-page essay on something, if I wrote fiction instead, I always got an A, because they thought that was really creative. <laughs> The secret, of course, was that it was a lot easier than an essay, so mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I would do that all the time. Um, I took classes from some really great people at Beloit College, um, including a class from Robert Ray, who pretty much, I think even he will admit, certainly his students will admit, that he's a way better teacher than a writer. That's <laughs> really bad mysteries. Um, <laughs> But he wrote a great class that was called Creative Writing Fiction. And all of us came in and we thought we were going to be doing like, you know, vignettes and short stories and the kind of things that we had done up until then. And the very first thing that he said to the class is, this semester you're going to write a novel. And most of us didn't get it done, but at least it got us to thinking about the way novels work, the structure of a novel, the kind of pace that we need. Um, and so that was kind of that was kind of novelist boot camp. Um, and I'd written a lot of other things that I didn't finish because my real weakness as a writer up until I first got published was finish this, please. Um, and I was working on I was actually working on Falcon and was partway through Falcon when I had this idea for a book, and I hadn't quite got the whole book, but I knew that the ending was going to be a magical duel in First Avenue. Um, and when I told that to Terry Windling, she said, excellent, send me three chapters in an outline, and if I like it, I'll buy it. <laughs> that meant I had to finish it. <laughs> so that now, then I found out that that was what I needed to finish stuff was somebody had put to say Here, here's your deadline. So, um, but I hadn't really, I hadn't written a whole novel before I, I wrote that. That one was just I lucked out. I mean, I really did luck out. That was primarily luck and a lot of reading because having read fiction in that kind of just vacuum it up sort of way, I had a really good sense for what a book sounded like in your head. And that, I think, might have been the most valuable thing to me in finishing that book, was that that and the Scribblies, who all of whom knew what they were doing, and I, even if I didn't, they did, and they would be able to tell me, OK, that thing there that you just did, that doesn't actually go in this book. So you don't want to think about whether you actually, you can make this a different book, but you kind of have to if you're going to keep that in there. Something like that. So. Um, looking back, it's easy to, to point at it now in retrospect and say that it was you know, different and, and it was, uh, I don't know if you call it genre defining, but um, Sub were you <laughs> subgenre defining? Um, were you intending to do that? Were you trying to write Heck something no. different? Heck you no. were just writing. Um, I just, I just had this notion for. I loved Minneapolis. I mean, I'd moved to Minneapolis right after college, and it had just been 
such I had, I had discovered so many cool things in Minneapolis and so many interesting people doing creative stuff and I got sort of this feeling of okay there are some cities that that they they have this mojo they have this creative vibe that goes on that encourages people to do stuff and some cities just don't seem to quite make it over that hump what 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 do you suppose it is and it's kind of for fun I said fairies <laughs> that's what it is and it just it just kind of all came together all the things that I loved about Minneapolis which I guess is why what I did was urban fantasy because Minneapolis had to be a character in there because it was Minneapolis that made so much of the idea possible um, and I I just in children's literature there's always been this stream of magic comes into the real world and interacts with real stuff. It just didn't happen to be a big part of fantasy, a, you know, fantasy written for adults anyway, um, at that time. Because it had, the, the, the genre had pretty much been defined by Tolkien on one side and Conan on the other side and various things sort of marching in from those sides and, and you know. Um, but another thing that was happening at the same time was very separate from genre fantasy was horror and horror was having a huge upswing at that time it was terribly popular um, all the, the, the new young punk horror writers uh, well they were young punks at the time um, uh, Skip and Spectre and all of those guys um, were doing all kinds of amazing things in horror, which was very naturally set in a contemporary setting. Um, and I think that came into it too. That was also a lot of the the, uh, the inspiration for what I did, for what Charles DeLint did when he wrote Moonheart. Charles has always been a big horror fan. And I think both of us were influenced by that sense of <coughs> the freedom to play with stuff that was right there around us and the sense of immediacy and authenticity that you got in a fantastic genre from putting things that were the opposite of fantastic in it so that you could say yes I have been to PP Plaza that doesn't mean that happened but it increases the chances because I have been to PP Plaza and that's what it looks like um, so I think all of those things were kind of working at the time and I didn't really think about I really didn't stop to think that what I was doing was something that not like other people were doing um, but it turned out it was so interesting you say Minneapolis said it had to be a character in the book because I, I had written something set in Minneapolis and someone told me you will never sell this because it's not in a big city like oh. New York or Chicago that's, or that's bullshit right. well <laughs> and that's <laughs> and that's what I said. But they did give me some good advice, unless you give it a reason to be in that city. And, yeah. and take that for what it's worth. But you certainly, in, in War for the Oaks, you certainly get the feel of the place. And the, you, you, it just naturally rises out of the city, yeah. which is great. Yeah, I think that, I mean, as much as I, 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 I read of Laurel K. Laurel K. Hamilton, I think she did a great job setting her first few books really clearly in that city that she was in. And it felt, had a real feel to it and, and a real oomph to it. And I don't think that they were harmed at all by not being in New York City or one of the big fashionable cities at the time. Um, and I think that's one of the things that you did really well was that the, the love affair that you had with the Twin Cities. And I mean, you know, I felt it in Bone Dance, too. Yeah. Yeah. So, we should the, probably... The, the book that is secretly set in Minneapolis and, and not everybody notices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the... This, this reminds me of, of two things. Um, two different conversations that I had with friends. One of them re is, is regarding the Harry Dresden books. Um, the friend lives in Chicago and she says, if you set your stories in Chicago, Chicago will love you to pieces because Chicago is the town that nobody gives any respect to. <laughs> and if your books are very firmly, solidly set in Chicago, and my only objection to the Harry Dresden books is, I want more Chicago! <laughs> you know, I want it to be really, really Chicago. 
but but apparently Chicago feels like it is like you know the, the ugly stepchild of fiction, and it wants to be in more fiction. So if any of you are familiar with Chicago, I am from Chicago. Set some there stuff there because Chicago <laughs> wants its place in fiction. Darn it! Mm -hmm. And the other thing was, if I was right after Will and I moved to Los Angeles, um, I was talking to somebody there, and he said, and I won't tell you who because. He said, uh, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that you could set a book like War for the Oaks in Los Angeles. You could set it in New York, you could set it in Minneapolis, you know, that's great, but you couldn't set it in, in Los Angeles because the veil isn't, isn't thin here. And I said, in Los Angeles? <laughs> Son, in Los Angeles, there hardly ain't no veil. <laughs> I mean, here, here you are in a town in which you can walk out your door and discover that they have turned half of your block into a, a, a post-apocalyptic wasteland, okay? And the, the, the other end of the block is lined with grip trucks and costume trailers and this and that and the other, and they, they mess with reality on a daily basis in Los Angeles. Do you think that the courts of fairy are not hanging out there 24-7? I think that the key thing is that LA is a really overdone locale because it's so easy to set things there for film and movies, and so unless you're really bringing out its wonderful characteristics, yeah, and that there it, are it, so it's just many, kind of boring to set there. That Los Angeles that I discovered when I got there, I thought I knew Los Angeles because all the TV shows are there, and all the, you know, even the shows that are so not set York. in Los Angeles are actually in Los Angeles. Um, and I thought I, I knew what it was. But when you move there, you realize that Los Angeles is, is this city composed of a set of little villages and towns. And each one of them is a little different. And they've got their own strengths and their own resources. And I, how can you not just keep setting things in Los Angeles and making up new stuff and you know anything that you need? It's any kind of magic that you want. It's there, depending on your neighborhood. You know, if you want to do Santeria, or if you want to do Chinese or Korean magic, it's there. It's a world city. It has everything. Um, and I finally decided to answer my friend who thought the veil wasn't been there by writing a story called De La Tierra, uh, which is set very much in Los Angeles. Uh, most of it in downtown, right downtown in like the jewelry district. Um, because you know, there's there's a, a, a there's a member of the, the the high court of fairy, and she's lying out by the pool at Chateau Marmont. <laughs> How can you not? And it was just it was so much fun to play with that assumption of well, you can't do that here. And as soon as somebody tells a writer you can't do that here, <laughs> the very first thing any writer is going to do, oh yeah, right, sure, tell me. Oh, oh which reminds me of another thing. You guys are never going to get to answer any questions because I keep asking these things. Um, um, another thing that I think went into the, 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 the creation and the boom of urban fantasy, um, I, I said at the time it was kind of like the two poles of Tolkien and Conan, um, Ursula Le Guin, I think, has a certain responsibility for creating urban fantasy because of her essay from Elfland to Poughkeepsie. Mm -hmm. Because she talked about the language of fantasy and how fantasy requires a certain language and it requires a certain seriousness and, and elevated quality to the narrative. And she said that to a bunch of writers. You don't say things like that to writers, because the very first thing they do is, well, what if it didn't? And I really think that that was one of the things that went into the idea that, well, you could set fantasy in the here and now, in the streets we know, in the lands we know, um, with a whole tone of character that is more familiar to us than the, the, the traditional British Isles hierarchical medievalist fantasy. So, yeah, her slow is, 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 she takes some of the blame, darn it. <laughs> um, I, I think I can speak for many of us here uh, when I say that 
although I'm very happy with the quality of your work, but the quantity <laughs> uh, could, could be improved. And I'm wondering, then, <laughs> if I were an editor, let's say, do you think that it would be a productive approach for me to call you up and say, I need a novel from you in three months. Go. <sighs> or, uh, Here's a contract. No if we figure this out, you need to call Patrick, because he's trying to get claim. He really, Patrick Nielsen, he was an editor at Tor, he would really like me to finish claim. He would have liked me to finish claim quite some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he has not yet figured out what it is that he needs to make this happen. Um, I mean, a locked room and you slide pieces under the door. Or <laughs> That Zombies. doesn't seem to do it either. Isolation doesn't seem to do it. Um, what I think one of the most frustrating things about writing is finding your own, the things that trigger you to muse. work, the things that, that keep you from, not so much muse, because the ideas are always there, but, but just that sense of, of, of butt in chair, fingers on keyboard or pen or however you write. Um, <laughs> I think that the hardest thing is knowing that every writer has a different way of doing these things and different tricks that will encourage them. And finding your own is this, this trial and error period. And I have been writing since, what, 87? And mine have changed over time. Um, one of the frustrating things for me uh, uh, with my, my, I was diagnosed with uh, uh, type 1 diabetes in beginning of 2002. And that changed everything. Because the way that I used to write, I used to go upstairs to my computer with a cup of coffee in one hand and a plate of cookies in the other. And there I was, I had the fuel, I had all of my ritual items, you know, and I was ready to go. Now suddenly I have to know how many cookies and how many grams of carbohydrate are in those cookies. And really there can only be so many because, you know, it's not good for you overall. And so it changed my entire system of things. So now I'm finding new ways to focus my attention. I suppose coffee and cookies was never really a very healthy one. It's like, you know, the writer who has the scotch in one hand and the cigarette in the other. It's like, no, dude, you've got to find a different way. Um, Zombie rights, maybe. <laughs> Why don't they have that? <laughs> that would be so great. I just have, you know, like a little, a little, a little thing crawl. that would update at the top of the screen, saying, "Okay, you know, zombies approaching in five minutes. You must type X number of words to escape." <laughs> there you go. Sounds like write or die. Yeah. This, yeah. this, this could do it. This could do it. Let's write or die. Conrad is Write or die. It's a website you go to, and there's a box where you start filling in, and if you stop typing, a counter will run down and delete your words if you don't write so many by a certain period. Oh, my God. And you, and you set the goal. <laughs> <laughs> you set the goal. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's gone, so. I use the opposite of writer or die. I use written kitten, where I set a goal, and I write so many words, and an adorable cute kitten pops up on my screen. Yep. I like that too. <laughs> now, and then they kill the kitten. The kitten is really very useful because you, you see the kitten and you go, oh, oh I made it's, a kitten. My, it's a kitten, I made my words. And then you go to, oh, maybe I'm going to see that the goes. next kitten. That's the next kitten. That's the next yeah. kitten, yeah. 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 Ooh, they should combine you... those apps. Yeah. Yeah. I, Zombies eat the carrot and the stick. Write many words or we kill the kitten. Have you seen Cats in Sinks? Cats in Sinks. I believe it's catsinsinks.com or .org or something. Well, I've seen my own cats in sinks, so I can see how and they... It's an entire collection, an apparently infinite collection of photographs of cats in sinks. <laughs> and it's hilarious, and the more of them you see, the funnier it gets. Even if they're basically, you know, yes, it's a cat lying in a sink, yes, it's a cat lying in a sink, it's a cat lying in a sink. Seriously, it's a cat lying in a sink. It just gets funnier and funnier. Maybe one of those winks in the sink. <laughs> oh, links in the sinks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kill questions. Come on, guys. We we got to dip. Go. You said that part of uh, your book claim involves the shootout at the OK Corral. Oh yeah. Have you read White Earp Speaks and the Last yes. Shootout? 
Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, oh, I want to. This this is so silly, but I want to actually do a bibliography at the end of this because I have so many cool references that I want to share with people. And there's amazing work. The amount of information, new information that keeps coming out about that event that happened 126 years ago or whatever is unbelievable. Yeah. And the lives of all of the people involved in it. There's there's my my. 5,000 people in the world theory applies so much to all of the history of the West because it seems as if everybody who, whose name you would recognize in the history of the American West knew everybody else up whose name you would recognize. Yeah. Um, well, it wasn't and, a long period of time. I mean, and, and people were, the people who, who you hear about were surprisingly mobile. Yes. We don't think of it as a time when, when people went very far away from home, but there were certain people who went from coast to coast and back again. Um, Bat Masterson ended up as a uh, sports reporter for a New York City paper. Um, and he missed the shootout by two days. And probably... Would have been involved. I wonder how things would have gone, because there were several things that were not a good idea. Mm -hmm. I will, t I will, I will mm -hmm. do gunfight neat, because I do gunfight neat, and I can't resist, because I've been <laughs> researching this and reading about it for Please so long. Please do gunfight. Um, gunfight at the OK Corral. Um, uh, the Earp brothers, namely Virgil, who was at the time the city constable in Tombstone, Arizona. His brother Wyatt, who was a deputy U.S. marshal at the time. Um, and his uh, even younger brother Wyatt was, was, Virgil was the oldest brother, not the oldest of the Earp brothers, but the oldest one on, uh, with boots on the ground at the shootout. And Wyatt then was his younger brother and younger still was Morgan Earp. Um, and Wyatt's friend, Doc Holliday, mm -hmm. who, quite frankly, had absolutely no lawman credentials whatsoever. Thank you very much. Um, these were the four guys who went down to disarm a group of people in a vacant lot behind the OK Corral. Um, because a law had fairly recently been passed that you weren't allowed to carry guns in, in the city of Tombstone unless you were on your way in or on your way out. They were arguably on their way out, but there had been trouble over the previous couple of days, and so these guys went to disarm them. And it is so much more complicated than that, I cannot even begin. Mm -hmm. The depths of the politics alone. Unbelievable. Po and these were politics that still resonate, which is really interesting. The split... Uh, in the in Cochise County, where Tombstone is located, between Southerners and Northerners, mm -hmm. um, cattle ranchers and mining people, uh, Democrats and Republicans, city dwellers, country dwellers, all of these splits were all at work at the time, and it and provided ones. this. Pardon? And racial ones too in that area too, aren't there? I mean, in terms mm -hmm. of the divisions. And things. Racial ones? Yeah. Actually, not so much. Not mm -hmm. in this particular fight. No. Not really? okay. It was all white guys. All white guys. Um, yeah, and there was there was certainly a lot of no, there was there was a feeling. The feeling in Tombstone was added to by the fact that um, Geronimo and, and many of, of his followers had just left the San Carlos Reservation, and they were moving from San Carlos down to Mexico, and, and everyone was terrified. They felt like the, the Apaches were going to descend on the town any minute, um, in spite of the fact that the Apaches never came anywhere near town before, <laughs> after, or whatever. Um, and so that was part of the kind of the paranoia that was underlying everything. But Virgil Earp, to my mind, was a very good lawman. He was a very good policeman. Um, he took it very seriously, and he was very professional, and that was what he saw himself as. Um, Wyatt Earp, though he had been a lawman for a while and had gotten a really good reputation at it, was mostly in Tombstone to make himself and his family rich. He wanted to strike it rich, mining silver. Um, in the meantime, he owned the uh, um, the gaming rights to the, the at the Oriental Saloon, and he was working as a U.S. Deputy Marshal. Um, he was one of those guys who wanted 
bigger things. And his younger brother Morgan, I have this theory that it must have been very difficult to be Wyatt Earp's younger brother. <laughs> because Morgan seemed to have kind of a impulse toward things that wouldn't have gotten Wyatt in trouble. But they were really bad for Morgan. And then, of course, there's Doc Holliday, who is ex-dentist, gambler, has a reputation as a gunfighter, but in fact, he doesn't, he's much better with a knife than a gun. His aim is not all that great, but he's just this huge wild card, loose cannon guy. And the worst thing that Virgil Earp ever did in his lawman career was select those three guys to go down and help him disarm these people. Mm -hmm. Because each of them had their reasons for introducing chaos into what could have been a perfectly stable situation. But even a really good lawman, under pressure, makes decisions that he felt he had to make at the time, and these, I really don't think he should have done that. <laughs> Whereas if Bat Masterson had been there, Replace one of those guys with Bat Masterson. And if you replaced Morgan, my theory is, if Bat Masterson had been there and been there instead of Morgan, everything would have happened differently. But, I go into more of this in the book, and you can probably figure out my, my <laughs> political inclinations from that. You know, well, you know, past politics. All of my political activism is like a hundred years old. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's really off to have a bibliography in the back of the fiction. No, I think that would be great. It's fairly common in, in YA, and with the whole common core thing coming out in with the schools where they've got the emphasis on pairing fiction and nonfiction, I, I think that that's actually not necessarily a bad thing, and if your publisher says no, well then you put it on your website as a also true yeah. as a as, yeah. as a as a as a binder. But I, I'm just saying that I mean there's a uh, this tremendous em emphasis on pairing fiction and nonfiction in uh, the kids' education field right now. Cool. This so, is our children's librarians. Because so one of the things that <laughs> one of the things that I wish I had more of was other writers' recommendations for nonfiction. You know, when you did this book about Arctic exploration, what were your favorite, you know, what, what, what were the things that you really got a lot of good out of? Who are the, the nonfiction writers that you think really cover this? Because usually when I read fiction that I really like this book, I want to know more about the background. It's like so, the yeah. behind the scenes of the DVD. Mm -hmm. It is, yes. it mm -hmm. is. Oh, it's the DVD extras, yes. <laughs> Well, I was just wondering if the uh, Wonder Woman as an urban fantasy character, um, does that have a designated publication already? Because I want to read that. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm still working okay. on it, and I'm the first place I'm going to send it is Tor.com, mm -hmm. because not only are they a nice market, but they get the best art. Uh -huh. You yeah. know, if you want a really good piece of art to go with your short story or novella or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you send it to Tor.com, because, well... They have a direct line to Irene Gallo, who is the art director at Tor, and she has a direct line to all the really good illustrators. So mm -hmm. that's that's going to be my first shot when I get it done. First, I have to get it done. Um, and I found when I was writing it that there was a, a, a tone of voice that kept that that wanted to be part of the story, and I haven't been able to achieve it, but I've gotten close enough to make me fairly happy, and what it is, is if Aaron Sorkin wrote urban fantasy, uh -huh. <laughs> because Aaron Sorkin's characters talk better than anybody else in the whole wide world, I love the way his characters talk. Okay. A little while ago, you were saying, talking about the politics and, and Tombstone and all that good stuff, and you said that you'll be able to read about that in the book. When was that going to be? <laughs> yeah, well, busted. <laughs> well, you know, I just wanted to let you know, if you need somebody to, to kind of vet it, help me get through, I'm one of the, I'm sure many, who would be happy to have that for you? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 Andre is right, you know, I, I write slow, and I 
kind of need to figure out a way to speed that up because, well, are any of you here knitters or sew or yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Well, then you are familiar with the concept of stash beyond life expectancy, <laughs> or sometimes referred to as stash in excess of life expectancy. I have that with story ideas. Yeah. It's like, okay, there's this book I want to write, and this book, and this book, and this book, and if I don't start writing faster, I'm going to run out of me before I run out of ideas. So, I really, Andre is right. I gotta, I gotta figure out how to re-motivate, so. Because, oh God, it's slow. Sounds like a <laughs> career opportunity for some industrious people to <laughs> be my, like the Something. personal trainer at the gym, but they sit there behind me and go, right, faster. One more right paragraph, faster. come on. <laughs> what, you can do one more, give it a right. dialogue, damn it, dialogue short. One more <laughs> line of dialogue, come on. So what brings you to town? Totally there were money in it. Oh, I live here. She lives here now. I live here now. You I'm, relocated. I, yes. I, have, I have lived here since, again, since February of, it's been, Two full years, so it must oh, be. Oh, I didn't even know you'd move back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to hear that. We've been, though. We've been busy. I, you know, we had, had a well. We got this little house, and it's a really cute little house. It's just adorable. It's just the right size. And when we got it, the entire inside was painted a kind of vague beige pink. Ooh. The entire <laughs> inside. Mm. Trim was white. Uh -huh. But you could hardly tell because this beige pink thing, nothing really contrasted with it. It was just kind of pink. <laughs> the entire house. <laughs> Except for the, the part of the kitchen that was entirely, the, you know, that 1950s kind of groove wood paneling, and it's actually wood, not vinyl, <laughs> but it's dark as somebody's hunting lodge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was most of the kitchen except for the very back part of the kitchen which was kind of lime chiffon green, including the ceiling. <laughs> There's been a lot of painting going on the last couple of years. <laughs> a whole lot of painting. But yes, there is now no more pink on the first floor. Yay, us. There's a horror story in there somewhere. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's nasty like because it did yeah. Have, yeah, it did have kind of that, you know, it wasn't quite it wasn't dark enough to be the muscle fibers underneath, but it had kind of a nasty sort of tinge of, oh, no, no, go away, ew. Just horrible. We actually, we saw a pink Mary Kay car on the way here. And I, I had heard of these things but never seen them, and I thought it would be Barbie doll pink, but it was almost white. It was just a little bit pink, and it was creepy just to look at it. Just <laughs> one drop of red in the yeah. white pearlized paint. Yes. Like the blood is just starting to diffuse. <laughs> 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 so you were talking about writing some of it, but I know that you did a collaboration with Steve first. Ah, that was the exception. Okay, now I was going to ask about that. Yes. Yes, Freedom. I, Steve Bruce and I collaborated on a book called Freedom and Necessity. Um, again, all of our, my politics are at least 100 years old, in this case 150 years old. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was, it, it, it basically, the start of it was my fault. Um, I was feeling really down and my writing wasn't going very well and I was just having a bad whatever that was, week, month, I don't remember how long it was going on. It was really gloomy. And I did what I do whenever I'm feeling really gloomy, which is resort to my comfort reading, which is all things that were written 150 years ago. Um, and had just finished uh, the entire run of Jane Austen, um, finished up with Lady Susan, which is an epistolary novel in which the characters write letters to each other. And I read the end of that, and I was sitting there thinking, and all of a sudden I got up and I turned on my computer, which I hadn't done in a long time, and I typed, let's see, what's the first line? Dear, dear Richard, I think you can't be an expectation of a letter from me. And I just kept typing, and it was the letter. It was the first letter. And I looked at it when I was done, and I said, what, what is this? This is a letter from a character that I don't even, I, I don't even know yet. <laughs> and he's talking about some kind of mysterious thing, and he's supposed to be dead, and what? Um, I looked at it, and I thought, what is this? <coughs> and I thought, I know what this is. 
this is a game. <laughs> Who do I want to play this game with? And there was really only one name. Steve! <laughs> so I printed a blur, I folded it up, I put it in an envelope, and I drove over to his house. I mean, instantly. I was just so fired up with this. Parked in front of his house, trotted up the steps, rang his door. Steve opened the door. He obviously was not in expectation of a visit from me. Um, and I'm standing on his porch, and I thrust out the envelope, and I say, you don't have to play, but if you want to, the ball's in your court. I turned around, went back to the car, and I okay. <laughs> <laughs> Steve said afterward that he was terrified. <laughs> he thought he had done something so perfectly horrible that the only way I could tell him was in a letter. <laughs> and he dreaded opening the envelope. But as soon as he opened the envelope, and I mean as soon as, I don't know how many hours it was until the next letter came back to me. And we had rules. We had to actually print them out and we had to deliver them and then be there when the other person read them after that first letter. So no email. We, no, no, no email. We got to sit there and watch the other person's reaction <laughs> while they read it. And it was great. It was like, you know, Steve would be sitting there and he'd go, and I'd say, what, what? And he'd say, that was a sniff. <laughs> was that one a laugh? Yes, that one was a laugh. And it, 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 we were horrible. It was great. And we had so much fun. Um, and I think we were about two-thirds through the story before we decided, yes, at this point, I think we have enough balls in the air that we actually need to sit down and talk about what the plot's going to be. And so we had that meeting. We then proceeded to write to the end of the book and finished it. And that is all the consultation that we made in advance about what that book was going to be about. We just told each other stories and sent the letters back and forth from the various characters. And it was just, it was so much fun. And it was so fast to do because we would write in expectation of getting to see our collaborator's response and their next section. And we couldn't get the next section unless we finished ours. Which led to a thing which I will never forgive Steve for, never, if I live to be a thousand. Mm -hmm. I was always, like, you know, writing these big, long, involved things. And I would, you know, it would take me like a week. And I would carry it off to Steve and he would read it. And the next day, he would give me his section. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, craft the next letter for Steve writes a lot faster than I do. <laughs> finally, finally, I knew I had him. I had him. I had a great big letter to pass on to him. I knew that that early evening, there was going to be an all-ages boiled and lead show at First Avenue, and he was going, and I was going, and he was going to go to that show, and then he was going to go to <clears throat> Chicago for a convention, I think. So I knew that if I got my section to him that day, I'd have the entire weekend to sit down and rest because he couldn't get a response to me. <laughs> so I took my section over to him sometime, I don't know, like 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, maybe noon, I don't know. It's great. I went to the Boiled and Lead show and he handed me his, <laughs> <laughs> his girlfriend at the time said, please don't ever do that again because you really don't want to see what it's like watching Steve drive while he's plotting. <laughs> I will never forgive Bruce for that. <laughs> but we had so much fun and it really was bad. It was amazing. <laughs> really fun. Uh, I don't know if you can tell us this, but is the gunfight in claim, is it going to happen the way the OK Corral gunfight actually happened? Or? <coughs> I, <coughs> I believe more or less um, taking into account some magical hand waving. Okay. Um, <coughs> and some possible conflict of Official statement versus possible reality. Uh, okay. 
Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult historical event. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it does so well is illustrate the, the undependability of eyewitness testimony. Mm -hmm. um, all of the stuff, the, the, the stuff from the inquest about the gunfight um, brought out facts that conflicted with other facts that could be true, that obviously couldn't be true. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, I'm actually kind of a, a, a fan of, of then Sheriff of Cochise County, John B., and I think he did actually a pretty good job with what he was given, but his statement in the inquest um, involved a, uh, a nickel-plated pearl-handled pistol that he thought was the first pistol drawn, and that Doc Holliday had just such a pistol. Um, but Doc Holliday was carrying Virgil Earp's shotgun. So why would he draw his pistol if he had a shotgun, which he was holding? That doesn't seem to make sense to me, so I think it's highly unlikely that that was the first pistol drawn, unless somebody else had a nickel-plated pearl-handled pistol, or somebody was playing with perceptions. So. Well, Bian had already tried to frame him for the stagecoach robbery that happened a couple months before. That was kind of interesting because, well, there are some facts that people attest to that make it look as if he might have done it, but almost certainly he didn't. I mean, there were a lot of people who were gunning for an awful lot of people in that, and nobody... Mm -hmm. I swear! I, it's got to be the water in Cochise County or something. <laughs> Cochise County is still like that. If there is something that you can reasonably disagree about, people in Cochise County will form up factions and scream at each other and try to get each other thrown out of office over it. And if you cannot reasonably argue about it, they'll do it anyway. It's really kind of weird. Very the, American. It's, it's, it's very frontier. I mean, there's still... The, the, the issues of, of immigration there and, and the, the permeability of the border um, have produced a, an, an effect that's really kind of like Geronimo and, and his followers leaving the San Carlos Reservation. People in Tombstone have this impression that they're, they're under siege, which is very strange because that's the last place that anyone is going to come if they're trying to sneak into the country. They're not going to walk into Tombstone. They're not going to do it. But Tombstone feels it's under siege. Um, the only place in Cochise County where this does not seem to be true is Bisbee, Arizona, God bless its heart, where I lived for three years. Um, Bisbee is just weird. Bisbee is put there as a, as a, 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 a balancing <laughs> thing for Tombstone. Tombstone where everybody will fight with each other and, and, and they come up with all kinds of really strange sort of conspiracy theories for how, you know, the government is out to get everybody and, 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 and well, they're weird. They're weird. Mm -hmm. Bisbee is weird in the entire opposite direction. Bisbee is full of artists and writers and poets and crazy people. Um, Lots of people living on disability and VA benefits because it's fairly cheap, and they're all kind of they're all biker hippies. It's great. It's a really fun town, <laughs> and they really are the polar opposite of Tombstone. So mm -hmm. both in Cochise County. I don't know. Um, what was I actually talking about there? I don't know. More questions? Maybe. Right. The the the, the, the gunfight. Okay. All done. Say <laughs> <laughs> you Um. It sounds like you pretty extensively researched sort of the historical setting in Tombstone and the events surrounding that, which is fully understandable. Um, I mean, when you were writing War of the Oaks, was, I mean, was that more sort of visceral, you know, I'm living here, this is my experience kind of thing, or did you find yourself doing sort of like a lot of research about the Twin Cities as well? Um, some of it was, was, I was drawing on information that I already had about the Twin Cities, stuff that I already found interesting about the cities. Um, there was also research I wanted to get a real 
on the ground sense of where everything happened and the physical relationship of all the places. Um, I had to fiddle just a little bit with the geography of Minnehaha Falls Park, but not too much. Um, visiting neighborhoods and getting a sense of what is the kind of neighborhood that's likely to have this kind of place. Um, and of course, the really traumatic part of the research was having to go to all those clubs and drink all that beer and listen to all that music. <laughs> <laughs> Sacrifice. Sacrifices you have. There, really, really, there is nothing I would not do for that book. But, uh, but, but, so there was, there was a lot of, of knowledge that I already had that I based it on, but there was also a lot of, of, of doing research and, and finding out what had been things like the history of, of uh, Minnehaha Creek and why it was at the center of things. Um, I needed to know, you know what was its historic place in the Twin Cities so that I knew why it would be significant. Um, one of the things that I figured when I left college and I stopped taking history courses, I figured I would I, I, I became a fantasy writer, and I would never have to look up anything again. <laughs> oh, child, if I could go back and tell you one thing from my, my current experience, oh God. So can you, uh, can you elaborate on your writing process? Uh, are you a plotter or a uh, outliner yes, or a, mm -hmm. just it's, you sit and write? It's a, little, it's a little different depending on the project, mm -hmm. the kind of project. Um, I never used to outline. I used to just have a, a, I would have a concept of scenes that I was writing toward and uh, an ending that I was working toward and it would change as I got there. Um, and that still basically happens, it always changes as I get there. Um, but when Will and I went to Los Angeles and we did some screenwriting, well, I found out how valuable an outline is for something where I'm writing with a very precise format and a very precise length. And I'm not spending a lot of time taking little jaunts off to the side and you know, that comes back here. I, I don't have room for those kind of little jaunts. Um, I've got to tell a certain number of stories uh, within a certain space they have to come together at a certain point, and they need to be broken up into an act stru structure. And to do that, I found that it was really useful to figure out what the heck I was going to say in the first place, and write it down, and what I needed to accomplish before I got to that. Um, and I still fall back on that when I'm trying to figure out how something's going to play, how much I've got how much I need to cover before I get to this event, things like that. It's really useful for me now to outline things, and that's that's kind of a big change in the way that I work. Because I used to just, you know, start where I thought it started and keep going, and usually that wasn't where it started, but I would fix that later. I'm a big fan of revision, because revision is the thing that makes it look as if you always knew that. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about Shadow You. It, it seems to be trending toward a conclusion. And, and we have two, <laughs> two, two more series. episodes. Is that all? Yes. Yeah. Um, any idea of any other series on the WTF that you might want to participate in? Um, probably not. I am probably not going to be the, the Tom Fontana, Barry Levinson of, of the, 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 the WTF, which is the name of the network. I, Andre knows all of the in-jokes. It's, it's, we, we, we have this, we've been doing this now for seven years. Wow. Yeah, we, Bear and I look at each other, well, over email, because Bear doesn't live here. So mostly we look at each other over email and say, we did it. We did it. We're two episodes away. We're about to finish the arc that we always had in mind, and we've been doing this for seven years. Um, for those of you who have the faintest idea what this is, and I can see from your faces that it is many, um, let me start with the origin story. Um, Will and I were on our first ever and possibly last book tour 
uh, in which we made kind of a Western U.S. and Canada book tour when his The Gospel of the Knife and My Territory came out. And they came out at the same time, so we went on this book tour. And we did it. We did a driving tour because we love road trips. We like to drive. And uh, and in the course of the road trip, as is often the case, we got to talking about what we, what kind of projects we wanted to work on, what we had in mind, what we were thinking about. And I said, "There's this thing I want to do, but I don't think it's a novel, and I don't think it's a short story collection. Um, but I don't know what it is. And it's this. It, it's the story about." an FBI unit that investigates crimes that are related to something called the anomaly. It's something that happens in people that gives them a kind of very low-level mental or, or, or mental combination physical superpower. Um, and I, you know, I talked to him about some of the characters that I imagined, and I said, it's like, it's like the X-Files meets Criminal Minds. Uh, and throw in some of the other stuff that I always loved, and that's, you know, it's all in there, and, but I don't know what it is, because I don't think it's a novel. And Will said, I, uh, actually, I said, you know what it's supposed to be? It's supposed to be a TV series. That's what I really want it to be, but I will not ever be able to get anybody to make this as a TV series. And Will said, you know what it is? It's a website. It's a web fiction series. And I said, yes, exactly. And we write up episodes in prose form, and I'm going to go and ask Elizabeth Bear if she wants to play. And this was another one of those, ooh, you want to play? <laughs> um, and I went to Bear, and she said, oh, hell yes. And we need to get Sarah Monette in this. And Amanda Downham couldn't do the, the, the web stuff and, 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 and write, but she only likes to write bad guys, so she, you know, she'll only write the bad guy point of view, and, uh, which is not actually true, but that's what she always says. Um, and we plotted out a five season arc of eight episodes per season um, with the cases that the team would investigate, and we developed the, the, the characteristics of the team. Uh, and Bear and I fought savagely over several of them and what they would do and you know what their, their personalities were and they are so much better for us having fought over them because they're, I think the, the great thing about it is because we had so many really smart writers in our writer's room. I, we talk about it in television terms because we still see it, though it's prose, we see it as a television series. Um, there are so many smart writers, all of them contributing to this. Um, weighing in on it first in email and then in a, a private life journal community where we discuss story ideas and characters and settings and things, that all of the stories and all of the characters are much bigger than any one of us would have created. They're much more complex. And we're always coming to those characters and finding that whatever we need already exists in their backstory and that we've already created people who are so complex that we pretty much believe they're real. Um, in contributing to that, that feeling of them being real, um, we decided that we would mess with the fourth wall. Um, three of the characters had live journals. Uh, and they, you know, people commented on the live journals and the characters answered back. Um, we incorporated into the, the season finale of the first season, we incorporated a, uh, uh, and set up in the real world on the live journals, um, that one of the characters was going to meet one of the readers in Texas. He was making a road trip to Texas and he was going to meet her and, and have barbecue. Um, and we did the season finale in real time, it went on over a period of, I forget how many days, seven days, eight days, uh, and we, we, we did it in real time, put it up on the web in real time sections. Um, and at the same time, the reader who was supposed to have barbecue with the character put up on her live journal, uh, has anyone heard anything from Chaz because he didn't show up last night? <laughs> And in the story, you find out why he didn't show up. And it just, 
real world, ha, huh, we mess with you. Um, <laughs> one of our favorite things has been, has been messing with the fourth wall and, and messing with the, the, the permeable interface between the real world and the stories. Um, we set the stories in real places uh, and at real times. We, we, we watch the weather reports for Washington, D.C. so that we know when the characters are complaining about the snow. Um, all of these things were, were it, it became so much more complex and interesting than something that I would have done by myself. Um, and I'm just obscenely proud of it. I am so pleased. Ah. Um, I have a question for you if nobody else does. Um, and that is because it sounds like you have one of the same writing demons that I have, and that is the demon of too much research. <laughs> and I want to know how you deal with it. And is are there times when you do the historical research and you go, well, fuck it. I this is not how it has happening in my story. When you discover that yes indeed somebody wasn't there at the time that they had that they should have been because they've been in that town all this time for all these months all around it, but that week they were gone. And then they left, yes. And, they, yeah, they, yes. Went, they went to Tucson for a week to, to, to do business and they weren't in town. Yes. Right, exactly. And you find that out and then do you say screw it and you say they need to be in here for the story and that vacation never happened. Because that's I, I'm getting to that point where I'm doing that and it's it's very tough for me to fight the research. Once I know the historical fact, it is very, uh, I don't mind if I've already put a supposition about magic in my world and that there's you know, voodoo stuff going on. Oh yeah, and, that's you know, no big deal. That's no big we're, deal. We're, we're I, introducing I, massive amounts of the supernatural right. into historical stuff. That's no big deal. That's no big deal. But the, the presence or absence but of historical... But that building wasn't built yet? Oh no. No. No, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm running into that issue. And I know that, I know personally, that there are maybe three people in the universe who actually know this fact other than me. Because, yes, because there are. Is, and they will all read it. And they will all, they will all, all, all send you a comment. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, what is, I love that. Yeah. Well, it's okay. I'm in communication with one of them already. But, you know, it's like, the, it, this is not. But one a, of the other two a, will then send you a comment saying, I have lost all faith in you as a reader because <laughs> those two streets don't ever have an intersection. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so, so do you, uh, do you, how do you deal with the the screw the, screw the facts? I need to just push forward with this plot and say. I mean, I've decided that I'm going to have a section at the end where I said, "Here's where I mess with history for the sake of the story," and that's how I've come that, to that terms. Will, that will actually be fun because that will be a chance for people to see the process. Of, yeah, that's of that's that's what how I actually come history. to terms with this. But do you run into this issue where you've got this storyline and, and you think to yourself, you know, sometimes you find a fact and you go, oh, this is perfect. This takes my story in a different direction. This is great. And sometimes, but sometimes it just stops you dead. And, and it's like, how do you run after that? How do you deal with that? I mean, I'm now I'm, I said, I'm at the screw it. I'm doing the story and I don't care about you stupid fact. <laughs> but <laughs> I've, I've, I've kind of met, not many, but several experiences sort of about that, sometimes directly about that. Um, when Steve and I were writing Freedom and Necessity, which is set in England in 1849, um, there was a lot that we were prepared to fiddle with as far as historical events. Um, uh, and we kept not actually having to. Mm -hmm. um, we were writing these letters and they were going back and forth remarkably quickly and we said, look, we're just going to hand wave this. This, you know, they're, they're, these people are getting mail at an, an, an exorbitant rate. <laughs> nope, they're not. And then we looked at the records of the mail service in 1849 and discovered mail was actually that fast to all parts of England in 1849. It's it, really it extraordinary. Was, yes. They got two mail deliveries a day. In fact, they got two mail deliveries a day up through the 1970s. Wow. Yeah, I know. Well, that's because that's because the phone wasn't big. I mean, it, well, big actually, that's because in the 1970s, the phone wasn't big in England. Phone service was terrible in England. Yes. And you made up for it by having a really great mail service. Or <laughs> telegram. <laughs> but yeah, there was that that we 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 were prepared to fiddle, and turned out that most of the things that we were prepared to fiddle, we didn't have to, which was nice. Um, with 
territory and now I'm playing, one of the things that I'm doing, one of the games that I'm playing with myself is, no, I'm going to stick to what's there. If, I have what's, if, if I'm sticking to what's there, how do I make that work in this particular weird magic jiggered universe? Um, my favorite piece of historical information turned into one of the events in territory. Um, there was, you know, how newspapers will have those little sidebars of like nuggets of news, you know, blip, 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 just a couple sentences on each topic. Um, the Tombstone Epitaph had one that mentioned having, no one, no one has yet determined the, 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 the origin of the arm found in the street on Monday. <laughs> I mean, dead serious. This was in the yeah. Tombstone Epitaph. I didn't make that up. <laughs> so I said, Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> and I put that in, and that was, yeah, I got you. I got you there. I know what happened. And so when I've got one of those things that I say, okay, if it's not there, I can't use it, I try to turn it into a machine for generating more story. Uh, that doesn't always work, but yeah. I try. And I also comfort myself with the fact that I am going to get it wrong. And I know I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get something, any number of things, wrong. And I will get those letters and emails and comments from all the people who read True S Magazine. God bless them. Uh, and that is God bless them in that nice southern lady <laughs> way. That bless their nice heart. southern bless lady. Her bless, heart. bless her heart. Yes. yes. I'm going to get those letters, and they are going to tell me that I am just. I have an entire crock of shit that I am full of, and none of that happened, and blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And I'm ready. It's okay. <laughs> well, I said, I try and try to generation, but there are times when the research will stop the story. And it, yeah. I've, I've run into a couple of those now with, 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 with mine, and it's like, so I've just started Stuff writing, where you feel like I've started I started writing my know. appendix now, so that it's like yeah. things that I changed. I need, so I need to know that little thing before I can go on, and sometimes it's a really stupid little thing, and you're trying to get yourself over that hump, and you have to say, you're writing fiction, you get to make it up, but you, you, you just you have to just get behind yourself and push yourself over that barrier. I had, I had that during Freedom of Necessity. Um, I was the one who introduced Frederick Engels into the narrative. Somebody got a letter from Frederick Engels, and we thought that was cool, and then Frederick Engels actually turned up in person, and it was in my section, and the characters had gone to Frederick Engels in Manchester, and they knock on the door, and the door is opened, and it's Engels, <clears throat> and I sat for three days trying to put words in Frederick Engels' mouth. Frederick Engels had enough of his own words, you know? He had just essays and books and all kinds of things, and he was a man of words, and I could not, I, I, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I didn't have the presumption to actually write down things that Frederick Engels hadn't said because he wasn't really there. Did you take Frederick Engels' actual speeches and bits and pieces? Because that's what I did with several of my characters. Is I took things that they said elsewhere and I popped them straight into my book. <laughs> we have kind of modified versions, and, yeah. and and Steve was kind of Steve was fabulous for that because Steve has a has an incredibly retentive sense of 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 language and and. and all written down things, and, and, and I could trust him to read Engels, distill it, and come back with his argument. But in, in a casual situation like this, where he was just greeting guests at the door, I felt like, oh god, I can't do this. And I had to take three days to go back and reread all the things that we knew about Engels, and all the things that his friends had said about him, and, and the kind of person he was, so that I knew what kind of guy had just opened the door. And that was nasty. I hated that. <laughs> All I had to do was have somebody say, oh, hi, good to see you, glad you got here safe, come in. But it had to be the way that this character would say it. Mm -hmm. And if I'd made up the character, I would have felt just fine doing that. But I hadn't made up the character. He was a real guy. Mm -hmm. Ha! That sucked. That's interesting. <laughs> so 
what you're saying is in, in this kind of speculative fiction, you have to worry about suspension of disbelief, whereas in other uh, stories, you can stretch that all over the place. Well, you always have to worry about suspension of disbelief, because readers always come to fiction knowing they know the rules of the universe. They, they know the rules that you've set up for the universe. Um, they know how they know how they expect people to believe. Um, they know what weather is like. They know what mountains are, you know. And if you don't, one of the great things about writing fantasy is that you can tap into your knowledge of the real world and make those things really concrete. And if you do things like, okay, Ray Bradbury, Dandelion Wine. Have you read Dandelion Wine? Mm -hmm. At the beginning of that, he starts with this kid waking up the first morning of summer, and he can hear the neighbor mowing the lawn, and he can smell the grass. And the very beginning of Dandelion Wine tells you, as soon as you read it, trust this guy, everything he says is true, because it's exactly like it's happened to you. It is such a perfect description of all of the sensory detail of that first waking up in the summer that you know that he's not lying to you. He observes clearly, he reproduces accurately, he has evoked all of your memories of childhood, and when he starts telling you things that cannot be true, well, they must be true because he knows what it's like to wake up in the morning in summer. Such a great example of doing that job right. It's just really So we, we, we've hit the almost out of time part, unfortunately. That's very sad. It makes me sad. Well, um, we're all crying right now. I'm so. glad that it makes me sad. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm one of those sorts of people who could just go on talking. Well, here's the thing. Which is something that <clears throat> I, I was parents actually... always asked me about. <laughs> really, are you the close? So, anything you, you would like <coughs> to say to this lovely group of writers before we wrap up here? Oh, geez, just the thing that I pretty much say to all groups of writers, which is, make me more stories, please. <laughs> because one of the things that we all share is that we come to this as readers. I mean, we wouldn't be writers if we hadn't been readers. And we want, we want people to tell us stories. And humanity has this gift for narrative. We will turn anything into a story. The process of going to the supermarket and buying the week's groceries can be turned into a story. An arm laying in the road. And an arm laying in the road. <laughs> uh, and you guys are, you guys are the keepers of that gift in a lot of ways. You're the ones who the rest of the world trusts to tell them stories. And we have kind of a job here. We need to fulfill our duty. So please, write stories, and I will read them, and they will make me happy. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.